Good afternoon. On behalf of President Joe Biden, welcome to the John Quincy Adams Presidential Wreath Laying Ceremony. I present this wreath on President Adams' 256th birthday. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. May I have the guests stand. Flag detail, present the colors. Hand salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now our national anthem. Flag detail, post the colors. Ready, two. Introducing Jacqueline Rodriguez, Vice President, United First Church, Paris Church. You may be seated. Again, I'm, in, I'm Jacqueline Rodriguez, and I'm the Vice President of United Fa uh, First Parish Church here. I am uh, basically taking the place of Fiona Schenke, who is our President today. So I want to welcome all of you. Welcome Honorable Mayor Thomas Koch. Dignitaries, Allison Doucette, Adams Family Descendant, Lieutenant Alicia Ping, a Navy Support Center from Quincy, Marianne Peake, Adams National Historic Park, Dr. Edward Fitzgerald, Quincy Historical Society, the Trident Bat Brass Quintet, and all of you, bienvenidos a todos. You will undoubtedly hear about how we honor our influential congregant, John Quincy Adams later in the program. We celebrate his legacy of equality at UFPC today and follow his values daily. A quote from J, J, uh, John Quincy Adams, who but shall learn that freedom is the prize man still is bound to rescue or maintain, that nature's gods commands the slave to rise, rise and on the oppressor's head to break the chain. Roll, years of promise, rapidly roll around, till not a slave shall on this earth by found. At UFPC, we not only believe in equality, 
as did John Quincy Adams, but practice it daily. We welcome all individuals into our church. Our congregation is organized as a democracy, governed by a board that is elected by the congregation. In our diversity, we encourage everyone to be in the room where it happens. I think John Quincy Adams would approve. We are inviting you on behalf of UFPC to attend a reception in the parish hall after the services with delicious cake from Kandidermeister. Thank you. Thank you. I'm the Reverend Rebecca Froome, lead minister here at United First Parish Church. I invite folks to take a deep breath together, settling in to this space that John Adams called the Stone Temple for the public worship of God. And we've expanded that to think of it as the stone temple for the public learning and deepening of values, honoring the highest ideals that any of us hold in our hearts. And so please lift your hearts in a spirit of invocation. Eternal presence, known by many names, known in many ways. We gather here in the heart of the city, acknowledging that people have lived here for generations, centuries, millennia. We acknowledge the Massachusetts people, the Neponset tribe, who have lived here for generations, stewarding the land, building community, and being part of the fabric of this community to this day. We acknowledge and remember the generations of people who have sat in these very seats for centuries before us to lift their hearts, to open their minds to the goodness that is possible individually and as a community. In this spirit of respect, may we open our hearts, our minds, to look backwards to the life of John Quincy Adams, on the anniversary of his birth, learning what we can so that we might strengthen our own commitment to democracy in the present and the future. May it be so. Amen. And blessed be. As we were discerning what the theme would be for this year's annual ceremony, Bill Westland and I talked about John Quincy Adams' legacy for diversity in public discourse, thinking that here in Quincy, an incredibly multicultural city, a city that has deepened its commitment recently to that multiculturalism with the created creation of a community liaison position, that it would be good to reflect on this legacy of multiculturalism. And I want to acknowledge Damien Otar, where are you? The new uh, community liaison over there, welcome. Uh, first time attendee, I believe, of, of this ceremony. Now looking backwards, multiculturalism was not part of the public discourse as a word in the life, in the time of John Quincy Adams. The word we can find again and again in his writings and his oratory is equality. And when I see his dedication to equality, I see that as opening the path to what we might now know of as diversity and inclusion. From a young age, he, is, he sees inequality in the form of slavery and is appalled. And throughout his very long career, and especially in the final chapter of his career when he was uh, in the United States Congress, he deepens his commitment to equality by bringing in diverse voices from society. He is in Congress committed to reading citizen petitions from people of many backgrounds, not all backgrounds. He was a prophet of his time, but also a product of his time. 
Many of the petitions he did read on the floor of Congress came from women, a group of people who didn't have the right to vote, who could not sit on a jury, but they would write often to ears that would not listen. But John Quincy Adams read their petitions on the floor of Congress, petitions that were often for abolition and the end of slavery. We rightfully celebrate John Quincy Adams as one of the leading voices of anti-slavery while he was in Congress. And part of the power of his voice is that he shared his voice. He took these petitions from ordinary women and men, people of different faith backgrounds, and brought their voices, their experiences, their ideas into the public sphere. So as we reflect today on the legacy of equality in the life of John Quincy Adams, I see that part of that legacy is expanding the political voices that are in the public, creating a more inclusive and more, more diverse society of leaders, bringing more ideas into the conversation of what forms of equality are possible for the future. Reverend Frome, Lieutenant Commander Peng, our distinguished platform guests, our sailors, thank you for your service. I'm joined uh, by Senator John Keenan. We have city councilors here, Jim Devine, Anthony Andronico, and Nina Liang. So I uh, thank you for joining us here, our colleagues in government, to honor uh, one of the greats from Quincy. You know, we think about uh, following in the footsteps of John and Abigail, how impossible that could be. Uh, yet John Quincy Adams seemed to fill those shoes. Uh, remarkable, perhaps the most remarkable public servant this nation has seen in all of his various roles. The Monroe Doctrine, chiefly written by him, the annexation of Florida, uh, thanks to him. His presidency was, uh, by historians, deemed not so successful. In his own words later in life, his enjoyment and joy years were really as a member of Congress. And as he was speaking about those issues that were important to him, based on principle, uh, really he was way ahead of Abraham Lincoln on the issue of slavery. In fact, John Quincy Adams' funeral was the largest in D.C. until Abraham Lincoln uh, was killed several years later. But I think the greatest compliment at that time was one of his political foes who said, John Quincy Adams didn't belong to a political party. John Quincy Adams belonged to the American people. God bless this all. The thing about families is while they bring love, they also bring responsibilities and a sense of duty to leave the world better than one found it. As Abigail Adams wrote to her son, John Quincy, before he headed abroad with his father in 1780, before he became the second president, Great necessities call out great virtues. When a mind is raised and animated by scenes that engage the heart, then those qualities that would otherwise lay dormant wake into life and form the character of the hero and the statesman. He must have taken her letter to heart. Everyone loves letters from their mother. As he admonished his fellow House members in Congress in not accepting women's petitions and rights, saying, why does it follow that women are fitted for nothing but the cares of domestic life, for bearing children and cooking food for the family? I say women exhibit the most exalted value when they depart from the domestic circle and enter the concerns of their country, humanity, and their God. When it came to petitions mentioning slavery and being denied to speak via the gag rule, he said it was a direct violation of the Constitution of the United States the rules of the House and the rights of my constituents, and that the freedom of debate has stifled in this House to a degree that is far beyond anything that has ever happened since the existence of the Constitution. And finally, in his letter in the Amistad trial, later years in the Amistad trial, John Quincy spoke these words. The moment you come to the Declaration of Independence that every man has a right to life 
and liberty, an inalienable right, this case is decided. I ask nothing more on behalf of these unfortunate men than this declaration. So as we all stand here at his grave and crypt, it is good to be reminded that as Americans, we have a history of speaking up for equality. That is our duty to serve, and it is our obligation to continue to strive to ensure that the United States is a country where all men and all women of all races and all creeds can walk equally together. Thank you. For those I haven't met, I'm Mary M. Peek, and as superintendent of the Adams National Historical Park for the National Park Service in Quincy, I continue to be inspired and motivated by the people I serve and the resources we preserve and protect for future generations. Let me share a very personal experience that took place at the Old House last Sunday when we hosted a 60-piece orchestra concert. It consisted of adults and youth playing patriotic music for everyone to enjoy. And after that experience, two people asked to see the Beale House. And as I was touring the Beale House with them, I couldn't help but be inspired that I had a John Adams and a John Quincy Adams in my midst. The father teaching and caring and showing, the son who was interested in the structure because he too lived in a 1700 uh, colonial home in Rhode Island. And he was so interested as a youth that I thought to myself, I bet he's going to be an architect. So I very excitedly said, and I, I bet you're going to study architecture. And he said, no, as a matter of fact, I'm interested in it, but I'm going to be a lawyer. And I looked into his eyes. And I saw the decisiveness of John Quincy Adams. There was no question that our sixth president was on a mission in his life. And it was that experience, the father and son, and the influence we have on youth today, all of us, that brought me to this particular talk in commemorating John Quincy Adams. It's not what or who John Quincy Adams became or what he did. With the many accomplishments in his life as a statesman, politico, leader, president, ambassador, lawyer, naturalist, scientist, poet, a writer, a defender, and more, he was a son, a father, a grandfather, a friend, a community leader. He made a difference. But it wasn't just that. No, it is not what he did. It is how he influenced you to become who you are, to fulfill your dreams and inspirations, how you help others to succeed, how you treat for peace as he did, how you serve and how you share, how your life's dreams are fulfilled, and as a result, how you accomplished all you sacrificed of self as he did. I'm a Rotarian, as the newly appointed Damien uh, for equality in the city of Quincy. We're both Rotarians, represented here. Perhaps there are others among us. But Rotarians have a motto to strive for service above self, such as John Quincy Adams did, and our military, our military who John Quincy Adams advocated. The Navy, whose motto is not, not self, but country. The Coast Guard, whose motto was Semper Paratus, always ready for the next mission. Or the US Army, this will defend. The Air Force, aim high, fly, fight, win. The National Guard, always ready, always there. And the US Marines, Semper Fidelis, always faithful, to each other, to our country, and the battles ahead. They fight for the right, our rights, and we thank you for serving. They fight for freedom, for integrity, diversity, equality, accessibility, inclusivity. John Quincy Adams wanted it all, not for himself, but for others. It is not because I said so, it's all documented in history's pages Adams' own letters and documents that are known to us all and accessible. 
old man eloquent, that's what he was called. He was labeled this by the fellow congressman while serving his community, his constituency from Quincy, his people within his community, here, right here in Quincy, Massachusetts, city of presidents. They called upon him and he served, our only president, to return to the House of Representatives after serving his term in the White House. Two representatives of Quincy have served in that high office, John Quincy Adams, President and the Honorable William Delahunt, we thank them both. So you and I can experience peace and fulfillment as we know it today, right here, right now. It is not who John Quincy Adams became that we will remember, because we are living it now and experiences, experiencing his sacrifices on our behalf. So we can be the best, we can do the right thing right, for once and mostly for all. Happy birthday, John Quincy Adams, on July 11, 1767, your 256th birthday anniversary. When as a young, very young boy, about 10, during the Rev. War 1776 era, he stood at 144 Franklin Street where he was born, aside his mother, Abigail, as soldiers marched past, coming home from the battleground at Bunkers Hill, where he and his family would harbor wounded soldiers and John Quincy Adams at the age of 10, would march and sing one step after another, mimicking the soldiers like any child would, as the soldiers passed by seeking encouragement and support. That child, born on Franklin Street, became our sixth president, following in his father's footsteps after serving as ambassadors, statesmen, secretary of state for international affairs. John Quincy was multilingual, learning some seven languages, German, Italian, Greek, Russian, French, Dutch, Spanish. Think about it. He spent his time treating for peace, traveling to Russia, to St. Petersburg, marrying his Louisa Catherine Adams, our first-born foreign, uh, first foreign born first lady, and befriending the Tsar Alexander to establish peace with Russia, becoming the only president to serve in the House of Representatives after serving his term in the White House, that same White House his father laid the cornerstone for in Washington, D.C. John Quincy's vision to establish the Smithsonian, understanding the role of science would play in our world. He planted trees for future generations. He swam and did eel fishing in Black's Creek. We even had the eel spear on exhibit in the kitchen at the old house. He spent hours peering over his celestial and terrestrial globes so prominent on exhibit in the study at the old house, and he rocked in his rocking chair reading a book, or many books, some of his 12,000 volumes located in the Stone Library, a library built by Charles Francis Adams to accommodate the family book collection. But it was more than a collection of books to impress. It was not that at all. They read them, they researched, they learned languages they were unfamiliar with, they wrote many of the volumes, and they valued poetry and novels and dictionaries, encyclopedias, maps, fish, Bibles, journals, and more, all mapping our country's journey, telling us the way that it was then and where we are now today. We must never forget the true meaning of freedom and at what cost. John Quincy Adams defended the many people. He, through his defense, provided them their freedom so they could go home to their country and Sierra Leone. It was one of his last actions, one of his last accomplishments in life. He did that uh, while he was serving as congressman. He was a role model for all of us. He did what we all strive to do. So let's get busy. Well done, John Quincy Adams. Well done. On behalf of Quincy Historical Society, um, I want to express our gratitude in being able to take part in honoring John Quincy Adams on his birthday. 
Uh, we have been asked, as you know, uh, as Reverend Froome has explained, to talk about John Quincy Adams and equality. The significance and implications of the declaration statement of a self-evident truth that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights has been perhaps the most enduring, the most contentious, and the most important subject of discussion and controversy in the American history. On top of that, uh, nobody ever said John Quincy Adams was a simple guy that was easy to understand. So um, we can only really make a few points about this very vast topic. I uh, want to also make one other point. Uh, because John Quincy was so smart, uh, we tend to think, I think, that uh, he, all his ideas were sort of, there, sort of there fully formed and just leapt from his brain and from the moment that he was uh, conscious to the day he died, he had the same ideas about everything. Um, only in the last few years have, they, have scholars begun to see that, like his personal doubts and his personal self-criticisms, uh, his ideas went through change, development, maybe even internal struggle. So I want to just look at a couple of the ways in which his ideas of equality may have developed over the course of his career. I think, as we all know, at the beginning, right after the revolution, um, Many of the founders were very skeptical of the idea of democracy and of the idea of equality, despite the, the language of the uh, Declaration. And in probably the first thing that John Quincy is recorded as saying about equality, he is a 19-year-old student. This is a debate when he's a student at Harvard, and it's right in the uh, end of Shays' Rebellion. So he kind of presents a kind of traditional argument that democracy is obviously going to lead to chaos, that you can't really have that much democracy. He says in his, deb in his debate, whether a pure democracy be the most favorable government to the liberties of the people, in a government where all men are equal, the people will infallibly become tyrants. Too great a degree of equality among the citizens is prejudicial to the whole. The present alarming situation of our own country, i.e. Shays' Rebellion, will afford us sufficient proof. Uh, now, he's arguing in a debate, and sometimes you have to take a position, but that is a sufficiently consistent kind of theme in his work all his life. Um, he is always afraid of the tyranny, or concerned about the tyranny of the majority. Uh, one of the things that constantly rankles him as an, as an adult and as a, a, a all through his career is the fact that the uh, party in America at the time, the, Demo the Democratic Party, which is most committed to universal white manhood suffrage, is also most committed to the institution of slavery. Um, so he needs to work out what it is that he believes. And um, his ideas of equality do move forward. They do change over the course of time. I think we can say that, and I think we can point to a little bit of how that happens. Uh, to, before we kind of look at the exact steps by which he advances, I think a couple of, maybe two or three preliminary remarks might be made. One is, um, on a personal level, John Quincy Adams was not a snob. He might have been a little bit of an intellectual snob, but in socially he was quite egalitarian. If you read his diary, no matter who he's meeting, he's basically treating them the same. He's basically re regarding them as the same. So, on a very personal level, he was an egalitarian. The question is, what was he po politically, and how, did he, and how did he get there? The other two things I would just say, because they tend to get forgotten, and uh, just to deal with them quickly, uh, there are at least two areas of the major fights over equality in his time that we would be somewhat disappointed in him about. Um, in terms of the rights of Native Americans, he recognized their rights but he was really unable, either as president or congressman, to move effectively or to rally public opinion to help Native Americans defend their rights. And as uh, Reverend Froome and uh, I think one of the other speakers mentioned, uh, he supported clearly women's right, First Amendment rights, but it's kind of an open question how much further he would have gone beyond that. Um, and I think maybe that hasn't actually been looked at as thoroughly as it could be. So what we're really back down to are popular democracy and the equality of everybody before the ballot box and the issue of slavery. 
And certainly by 1825, when he is inaugurated, he is able to describe the form of government of the United States as one of universal rights, universal equal rights. And he is able to be the first president in the history of the country to refer to our form of government as a representative democracy. So how does he get there? Well, I think one of the ways that we can see that he gets there, and here I'm relying, uh, I have to say, on books by two very excellent scholars, Pauline Mayer and Professor Daniel Allen of um, Harvard, um, whose book, Our Declaration, I think everybody in the world should read. Um, he becomes part of a group of people that begin to move back to the Declaration of Independence, which has largely been forgotten, and to begin to move to make that um, our, our real founding document. And it, he begins really early, uh, in 1802, uh, when he is a senator, very early in his career. He starts this process even further back by giving a speech in Plymouth in which he points to the Mayflower Compact as the beginning of self-government in the United States. But in 1821, he gives, as Secretary of State, he's invited by the citizens of Washington, D.C. Washington, to give the 4th of July oration. And at that, he discusses the Declaration of Independence. He actually even reads the Declaration of Independence, and then he begins to analyze the Declaration of Independence. And he's, he does something very important that we don't, I think, recognize today. He moves away from what had been really the center of interest about the Declaration, which is the grievances, the justification of why Britain had been tyranny, tyrannical and why it was necessary to break, and goes back to the preamble, to the Jeffersonian Declaration of um, Self-Evident Truths. And he says, the interest which in this paper, in other words, the Declaration, has survived the occasion on which it interest, on which, ooh, excuse me, upon which it was interest, issued, I'm sorry, the interest which is of every age and every clime, the interest which quickens with the lapse of years, spreads as it grows old, brightens as it recedes, is in the principles which it proclaims. It was the first solemn declaration by a nation of the only legitimate foundation of civil government. It was the cornerstone of a new fabric destined to cover the surface of the globe. It demolished at a stroke the lawfulness of all governments founded upon conquest. It swept away all the rubbish of accumulated centuries of servitude. It announced in practical form to the world the transcendent truth of the unalienable sovereignty of the people. Um, it's a paradigm shift, essentially. He's not the only one at the time who manages to do this, but he is certainly an essential part of it. And from that, much flows. Um, I would like to actually go back to the poem that Ms. Rodriguez cited uh, in her remarks. This, um, I think, is really the next step on what's, what's happening with him. Um, and the situation of that is what I want to talk about particularly. This poem was written on October 30th, 1826. This was the first John Adams birthday after John Adams had died on July 4th, 1826. And Adams records in his diary, he's back in Washington, um, and he records taking a walk around the Capitol, and he says the sonnet came to him, and he wrote it down in his diary. Okay, so far so good, but a couple of things. Because John had died on July 4th, 1826, John Quincy has really spent most of the last couple of months before that here in Quincy, settling the estate, and really going through a remarkable amount of soul searching. Um, I think, and I think probably a lot of people on the panel would agree, that John Quincy was always better, and so was John when they kind of stayed in touch with Quincy. Um, and he frames the poem as a memorial to his father. It begins, and we won't read the whole thing again, but he begins by talking about the fact that it's the day of my father's birth. His father is dead, he says, but his work goes on. And the work is the Declaration of Independence. And he, um, again, universalizes, as the part from Mrs. Ms. Rodriguez read, 
Where on earth's wide ball shall man be met while time shall run, but from thy spirit brave shall learn to grasp the boon his maker gave and spurn the tyrant's threat? Who but that shall learn that freedom is the prize man still is bound to rescue or maintain, that nature's God commands the slave to rise and on the oppressor's head break his chain? Roll years of promise, roll rapidly round, till a slave shall on this earth not be found. Uh, I would suggest that you take a look at the violence of that imagery, to break upon the oppressor's head, the chain. Uh, nature's God commands the slave to rise. He's, he's moved. This is not... Um, John Quincy Adams being diplomatic. This is John Quincy Adams becoming fiery. This is, I think, the birth of the fiery John Quincy Adams who begins to recognize the equality of all men. The final thing about this is, in the diary, it's written in shorthand, a private shorthand, a shorthand he invented himself. And he did this for a couple of things. He did it when he was recording routine stuff that he didn't want to have to take the time to write out like what the weather was or something. But he also did it when he was talking about very personal stuff. And I think he says here, if it was a better poem, I would have written it out in full language. I think he's, I think that's not the case. I think he's in, he knows this diary is going to be read. People already ask to see his diary because it's so meticulous. So he knows there's a possibility that people can read it. And I think he knows not that the poem isn't good, but that the poem is dangerous. And from that, he moves on. This, from then, he becomes the old man eloquent that uh, Marianne Peek has described. And um, the militancy of his voice, and the militancy of his voice for universal human rights, the recognition that he has been coming to that human rights are universal, and therefore all people are equal, uh, reaches, I think, probably its fullest expression in the phrase that uh, you read now, that from the defense of the Amistad. The moment you come to the Declaration of Independence, that every man has a right to life and liberty, an inalienable right, this case is decided. So in giving him his fair respect, I think we would say he is not the perfect or the most advanced advocate of equality, but he is perhaps one of the most vital advocates of equality because he, makes, he is one of several people who begin a process of language that makes possible Lincoln at Gettysburg saying, our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation dedicate, uh, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Thank you. Dr. Fitzgerald, thank you. The details that you, you gave really just provide like a deep imagery and understanding of John Quincy Adams, so thank you for that. We will now place the wreath from, President, from the President of the United States on the tomb of President John Quincy Adams. Please remain seated until the presentation is complete. We, we will return to retire the colors. Gather, let's just rest our hands with respect on this tomb. Return to that deep breath of life and love that moves within, between, and beyond us all and transcends the limits of life and death. John Quincy Adams, we honor your birthday today. We honor your life, your legacy. May you continue to be a blessing to the world. And may we be guided by the highest aspirations that we shared. Amen. I know it's hot. I'll be brief. But before I start, I'd like to just point out, this is the last wreath laying, Lieutenant Commander. And we just want to watch you. Thank you for your service and have a long and really nice retirement. And I'm just going to have three quick quotes which maybe would sum up John Quincy Adams. And the first one is a family member, Charles, Fran Charles Francis Adams, whose plaque is over here, 
Among other things, he was the ambassador to Great Britain during the Civil War. He donated the plaque and bust of my right here. And at the dedication, this is what he said. Amidst the storms of civil commotion, he nursed the vigor which serves the statesman and a patriot. For more than half a century, whenever his country called for his labors in any capacity, he never spared them in her, in her, in her cause. And now the second one, it's always nice to have a political opponent. And Martin Van Buren, who of course was a two presidents after John Quincy Adams, but a long time opponent, had this to say. This is just when he learned of the death of John Quincy Adams. This is what he said. Mr. Adams was an honest man, not only incorruptible himself, but also an enemy the venality in every department of public service. He loved his country, desired to serve it usefully, and was properly ambitious of the honor of doing so. And finally, at the funeral service, our own minister, William Parsons Lund, had this to say. We should review his long, useful, and illustrious life, recount the principal incidents of his career, and draw from his well-known character lessons that may be edifying. Where in history can you find such a glorious destiny assigned to a single life? And that probably really sums up John Quincy Adams. And I want to thank all of you for coming here on a hot day. And after the ceremony, if you want to get out and see the crypt, and that has the wreath down there, uh, be great. Also, up in the parish hall, uh, have a piece of Condita Meister birthday cake while it lasts. And we invite you to do that as well. So once again, thank you, and thank everybody that participated. And now I'll turn it over to Reverend Froome, who incidentally is a 24th minister. Let's return again to that deep breath of life and love, always there to guide and ground us. Beloveds, we have gathered today to honor a life by deepening our awareness of the life of John Quincy Adams. Many a wise person have said that the arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. In the arc of John Quincy Adams' life, we saw him bend his work towards equality. Mindful and grateful for the human ability to grow and change throughout all ages and stages of life. May we each, in our own way, leave this space inspired by the life and the legacy of John Quincy Adams. May we be inspired by his values. May we challenge and encourage ourselves and one another to embody our highest values for equality. May it be so. Amen. Color Guard, prepare to retire the colors. Retire the colors. <laughs> 